So good morning, so glad to see all of you on this Labor Day weekend. And uh, we're in a new series today called Miracle Worker. Miracle Worker, Jesus is the miracle worker. So I wanna ask you before we start, what do you think of when I, you hear the word miracle? Everything, something popped into all of your heads. The way you define a miracle. What do you think of? We often apply the word miracle to things that we think would be amazing, but probably won't ever happen, right? It would be a miracle if it happened. Here's some examples. When someone has stage four cancer and they've been given that diagnosis, we think it would be a miracle if they would be heal healed, right? Stage four, that's about as bad as it gets. I know someone like that in a previous church, a gentleman who was not a believer. He was the son of a lady that attended the church and he had stage four cancer. And she brought him to church and all the men of the church went into a room and we all laid our heads, hands on him. Pastors, elders, everyone, all the men in the church. He beat it. He was clean. All the cancer was gone. He kept coming to church and he came to know the Lord and he got baptized and then he got it again and he passed away. What's the difference between before and after? God healed him. It was a miracle and he was able to find Jesus Christ and now he's in heaven. So that's a miracle. We find, what about when we find ourselves heading down for sure disaster, but in some way we were spared? Have you been through that? Has that happened to you? I have two examples of it. One is that Fran and I were driving down this road, the light turned green, and Pastor Chris took off, and it was this big bridge overhang. And a gentleman was sitting there with his turn signal on, and for some reason he had been there. But when I was about 10 feet from him, he decided to turn right in front of me. And then when he saw that I was there, he stopped. So I ended up, rather than missing him to the left, I went around him this way, right towards the bridge abutment. God steered the car around him and right onto the road. That was a miracle. We're going to show you a map here. You're going to be more familiar with this area than I am. We're taking 183. Let's take it the back way because we were coming from 61 and we just passed uh, the company Hydro. And we're just coming up. So the opposite, we're coming from top, top down to that intersection there where we're going to turn left on South Silliman Street and North Silliman Street becomes 901. I don't know if you're familiar with that Crisona area. <coughs> so we are right between the West Branch Schuylkill River and River Street. I'm actually stopped and river be I'm right between the two facing down and I left an opening for the River Street for the person to come from your left to right and come out into traffic. We're just sitting there in the car. And this guy's sitting there and kind of nosing his nose out. People, cars are coming by me. And then he gunned it. He just slammed it on the accelerator and comes out. Well, there was a car right there. He, he hits the car right here in front of us. His momentum pushes the car out towards the bridge that's there over the river. Then this man's momentum pushes him back towards behind us and slams into the car parked behind us. Fran looked out of the side mirror and she could see the driver of the car behind us. It had shifted his whole car over so she could see the driver. Fran said, how did we not get hit? It literally did an arc around our car and into the poor man behind us who did nothing wrong. Now we're sitting in the middle of all the chaos. So we drive and Fran goes, he had to have hit us. I said, I don't think he did. He had to have hit us. So I pull off the side of the road, and we both get out and look at the car. It was a miracle. Not for the man behind us, but there was no way we didn't get hit. 
All right, I have one here you're all going to groan over. Anybody in here an Eagles fan? No, it's not just me. <laughs> Come on. All right, maybe it is. We have a thing we call Miracle in the Meadowlands. Have you ever heard of that? The Eagles were down and out. There were seconds left. They're playing the Giants up in the Meadowlands, and all they had to do is kneel down, but instead the quarterback picked it up and went to hand it off, and he fumbled, and our guy picked it up and ran it back for touchdown, and that was called Miracle in the Meadowlands. And then we had another one where we were going to lose the game, and they punted to us, and Deshaun Jackson ran the whole thing back. And it was this, we have two miracle. Of the, so this is how we use the word. Okay, Chris, enough of your stories. <coughs> we say that would be a miracle if that would happen. Well, the definition of a miracle is a highly improbable or extraordinary event, development, or accomplishment that brings very welcome consequences. I think we would all agree to that. They're very rare in our lives, in our world today. We often see them as a false, as being false. It wasn't really a miracle. We're just exaggerating the, the unexplainable event. But Jesus was the ultimate miracle worker. He performed many miracles throughout his earthly ministry. Each was seen by dozens, sometimes hundreds, and even thousands of witnesses. Jesus is the miracle worker. And just as he made miracle after miracle happen when he walked the earth more than 2,000 years ago, he wants to do a miracle in your life today. So over the next seven weeks, we're going to look at actual, real, honest-to-goodness miracles by the true miracle worker, Jesus. And today, we're going to be looking at Jesus' first miracle recorded in John and the changing of water into wine. Changing water into wine. Today, we are starting where Jesus started out, at the wedding at Cana. So, if you would turn in your Bibles or follow along on the screen, John 2, 1 to 12. I'm doing it from the English Standard Version, and I'll explain when I'm finished why. <coughs> on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus ran to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to, to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And so they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine is given to them, is what he's saying. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Now, why did I do the English Standard Version? Well, because you'll see it started out on the third day. The, the New Living Translation started out the next day. And I saw that as a difference. It's not really, because if you go into John, the first, um, the first things happening in there, the testimony of John the Baptist was the first day. And then you'll notice in, in verse 29 of chapter 1, it says the next day. And then at, when he goes for his disciples in chapter 1, verse 35, it says the following day. So basically now at the wedding, it's the third day. So I didn't want to confuse that and have read the next day when your translations would say the third day. And that is the only significance of that. Uh, some commentators have compared this to three days in, in, in the tomb and all the rest of it. I don't necessarily see that, but that's not what we're going to be talking about today. So what is happening here? Jesus is fresh off his 40 days in the desert and his temptation 
and his baptism with John the Baptist. And he has chosen some of his disciples. And he and his disciples have been invited to this wedding. The disciples were present. Uh, the ones that are noted, Andrew, Simon, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel, along with Jesus' mother, Mary. So point one is, Jesus enjoys celebration and fellowship with us. What do we learn about Jesus right here and now, right in the beginning of John? He goes to weddings. He enjoys celebration. It, celebrations and wedding celebrations were major events in this culture. They went on for days. Jesus enjoys celebration and fellowshipping with us. Now, we don't know what Jesus' relationship was with the family or maybe the bride and groom, but it was probably close as his disciples and his mother were also there. It says a lot about the kind of man that he was. He was fun. He was loving. He enjoyed fellowship with others. You might think Jesus, being God, he wasn't... He, he wasn't serious. He wasn't overbearing. He was someone that you would want to be around. He was that kind of person. On many occasions, he used weddings and feasts to illustrate his parables. That's how big of a thing it was in their culture. In Matthew 22, too, he starts out, The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. We know in the prodigal son, when the prodigal returned, he said, kill the fatted calf and let's have a celebration and celebrate because my son was lost and now he's found. We know the parable of the ten bridesmaids and the wedding feast. They were to have enough oil and they, half of them did and half of them didn't. And they were waiting for the bridegroom to go into the wedding feast. This was a major thing for these people. And so they would, this was what Jesus has now been invited to. And Jesus was and is all about fellowship with his body, the church. But he's also interested in fellowship with each of us individually. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says, God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I often think we see Jesus as a downer when you imagine what he was like. You know, you can't have fun if you're a Christian. We shouldn't laugh and joke in church. It should be serious all the time. We should be serious. Now, you know that I joke from up here, so you already know I don't believe in that. But we can have joy and fun while we're showing respect to God and Jesus. You can do both. Remember, this building isn't the church. We are. And God and Jesus grafted us into his family. Families have fun. So it's not a bad thing to have fun together in church. And Jesus... I want you to see him in that way. So if we go on in verse 3, it says, Well, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. There's not a lot of dialogue really put here. There's very short statements or no statements at all. It's very interesting. They have no wine. Like you need to do something about it or what are we going to do? It wasn't a question. It says, Jesus, they have no wine left. Point two is, when we know whom we trust, we can ask anything. When we know in whom we trust, we can ask anything. The wedding celebration was a common occurrence in their society. It was a multi-day celebration. Wine and their culture. It was, let's explain that. We're talking about wine here. If you look at wine today, it is a, first, a, a certain alcohol content. It was not the same in that day. They would ferment their grapes, and they would make wine, and then they would mix it two-thirds water to the one-third wine. It did two things. It diluted the alcohol content by 50%. So you had to drink a lot of this wine to get intoxicated, number one. Number two, it helped the water by putting the fermented wine into it to kill bacteria and other things in the water. So this was their staple drink. So when we talk about wine, I want you to understand what we're talking about. We're not talking about what you would go and buy in a bottle in a, in a state store or it's even in supermarkets now. Wherever you would go buy it, it, it's not the same alcohol content. All right, so let's understand that. But running out of wine at a wedding that was multiple days long, Merrill Tooney has this to say, to fail in providing adequately for the guests would involve social disgrace. 
In the closely knit communities of Jesus' day, such an error would never be forgotten and would haunt the newly married couple all their lives. Now, we don't really understand this. This isn't a common thing in our culture, but I was thinking uh, when I was going over this, that if we look at the Amish community, they're, they're closed community, and when they get together, they have certain things that they do. So if you kind of imagine they dress the way they dress, they, they believe what they believe, they, they make rules for themselves and that to live, and they're trying to stay away from the world. They, they, this, is, this is only in general, folks. It's not all Amish, but they tend to believe they can lose their salvation. That's, that's part of the reason they live the lives they do, where they remove themselves from the things they think are in the world that they should stay away from. And, and even in their clothing and looking uh, attracting the opposite sex and all of that, that, that's what that's about. So, if you try to compare it to that, to the, to the Jewish community, this meant everything, and it was a stain that would have been on that married couple's ledger forever. Everyone would remember, oh, remember the wedding they had and they ran out of wine? That would have like been a bad, bad thing. James Montgomery Boyce, a, a great pastor and He's passed away. Additionally, he writes, additionally, rabbis of that day considered wine a symbol of joy. And therefore, to run out of wine would almost have been the equivalent of admitting that neither the guests nor the bride and groom were happy. There was so much tied together to the wedding. It was social embarrassment and disgrace. Mary comes to him and says, they have no wine. They have four words. This shows a window into the relationship between Jesus and the bride and groom. I think it should lead us to believe that this is either someone associated with their family that they've been invited to, and it's Mary that comes to him to let him know. In other words, she's in the inner circle of knowing what's going on with the food and the wine, and she knows it, and she goes directly to him. The fact that she was the one asking Jesus gives us an indication of the relationship of Mary, and, and she wanted to spare the married couple this disgrace. She knew who to turn to. She knew who Jesus was, and she went directly to the source. So w you've heard me say this a lot. In times of trouble, do you go directly to the source? It doesn't have to be a large problem. It could be a sm small problem. Do you turn to the source? Do you go to Jesus first? That's what we need to learn. I will tell you that if you learn nothing else from me in the years that I'm going to be here, notice I'm saying how long I'm going to be here. If you learn nothing else from me, you need to know that God is approachable, that he loves you, that he wants to have an intimate relationship with you. Now, I know that's hard to comprehend. That's really hard to comprehend. The God of the universe wants a relationship, especially an intimate relationship with me. Really? Yes. Remember, to know and be known by Christ. It's a two-way relationship. When we know him, our confidence in that relationship allows us to know he wants the best for us. 1 John 5 says this. This is the confidence which we, which, which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. There was a very important statement in there. It has to be according to his will. It doesn't mean you can ask God for anything and he's going to be giving it to you. It has to be according to his will. But if you do that, if you have a relationship with him and you're of an intimate relationship and you know you're turning to him, He's going to give you the desires of your needs and the desires of your heart when you're walking according to his purpose and walking in his plan. We can know that when we know and trust him, we can know that he will provide all that we need and want according to his will. It says in Jeremiah 17, But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a river bank with roots which reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by the long months of drought. Their leaves stay green 
and they never stop producing fruit. When we trust in the Lord, it's like we're anchored down and we're going to be supplied with everything that we need. So what we need to know is that we can have confidence and hope due to our relationship with him. It's the relationship that you have confidence in. But how and when he answers us is according to his timing. Point three is Jesus' timing follows the Father's timing, not ours. Jesus' timing follows the Father's timing, not ours. Verse four, and Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, on the surface, this response really can feel harsh or rude. For him to answer his mother like that, woman? What's this got to do with me? But what we really need to understand is this doesn't work in English like it actually would have been said by Jesus. Woman was, a, was actually a term of respect. Like we would say lady, saying a, a, a woman is a lady in the English. It's expressing courtesy. But notice what he didn't say. He didn't say mother. Jesus was letting her know that his earthly ministry was beginning and now his relationship with her was different. He was saying, we now have a different relationship. I now need to consult my heavenly father. John 5, 19, and Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. This is a cosmic shift from Mary being, being the son of Mary to being the son of God. This has changed. He's 30 and he's going into his ministry now and it was time to refocus. She didn't stop being his mother but his relationship with her changed. This was beginning, he was beginning what he was sent here to do. This is the road to the cross that he was beginning to walk. Things had to change. Mary knew this day would come. She just wasn't sure it was happening this soon. You notice there's no mention of Joseph, which may mean he's deceased. So Mary was coming not only to her eldest son for help, but she knew he had connections. She knew who he was. And Jesus was, what she didn't know was, Jesus was operating by a different timetable. Second Peter 3.8 says, But do not overlook this fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Just before Jesus' ascension into heaven, the disciples were asking him when Israel would be set free and the kingdom would be restored. He said in Acts 1.7, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. So like Mary, we don't know all that God has planned, do we? We don't know what he's got planned, what he's got going on in the background. That's where trust and faith comes in. What, is, what his timing is or when we will see the answer to our prayers is up to him. But what we do know is our confidence is rooted in our knowledge of him. Our confidence is rooted in our knowledge of him. Our confidence is equal to our knowledge of who he is. That's what it's saying. It's equal to it. Verse 5, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. I found it amazing here that Mary didn't argue. She didn't try to persuade or convince Jesus. She was secure in her request based on what she knew about Jesus. I have a quote by RVG Tasker here, and she knew he will indeed take action, as she was so very sure he would when she told her servants to do whatever he told them. But he will act in his own way for his own reasons and at his own time. Does that not apply to us? When we pray to him and we ask him for something to happen, it's in his time, and we just want it done yesterday. Tomorrow would be okay, but I wish it was done already. A week, a month, six months from now, I have to wait. We don't know what God's doing, working in our lives and other people's lives to bring about the answer to our prayer. 
but we know he will act in his own way, for his own reasons, and at his own time. Her response said, our relationship has changed from mother's son. That's sorry, his, his response says, we changed from mother's son, but who he was did not change. Her confidence was based in who she knew he was. How does she know that? Well, in Luke 1, we remember when she was t- met with the angel. He said, don't be afraid, Mary. The angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. She knew exactly who he was. She knew exactly who it was she was coming to. She had been given direct information from heaven itself who her son was. He was the Messiah, the Savior of Israel, to set them free from their sins and the Son of God. We have that same confidence. He is the same God who wants to set us free from our occupation, uh, being occupied, not occupied, without being taken over by sin and by this world. The Son of God, he is the Son of God for us as well. The difference is that we are already set free. We are already set free from this being tied to sin. We have the same confidence, the same God. He wants to set us free. It says in Colossians 2, 6-7, Therefore you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him having freely firmly having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude our response must be gratitude for his love his instruction and the salvation that he's given us we're called to walk according to his direction be, direction because obeying his direction always exceeds our expectations Obeying his direction, when we follow what he, where he's leading us, it always exceeds our expectations. <clears throat> Let's go on, verse 6. And now, these were, now, and now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And so they took it. He didn't check it. He didn't have them check it. He said, fill them with water. They all full. Take them out and have him check it. Have him taste it. Here are some points that we need to take out of this. Jesus uses what is on hand. He could have created wine numerous ways. He saw the pots. He told them to fill them with water. And he turned them into wine. God can use us at any time, in any situation, to perform a miracle in someone else's life. The question is, are we willing to be used? Remember, God will use what's on hand. Are you on hand? Are you saying, I'm here, Lord, I'm willing? When he calls you to witness to someone, when he calls you to help someone out financially, I, I, someone in this, they're not here today, but he told me the story that God told him, I need you to take this amount of money and give it to this person over there that he knows. He didn't have that money to give, but he felt God told him to do it. He went up to the person and said, God told me to give you this. And I heard that story and I went, well, that's amazing. He tells me lots of times God says things to him. He tells him to do things like that. Go to this church or do this. There's a reason when he gets there. It's pretty amazing. A short time later, probably two weeks later, I happened to be in an event where the person was that he gave the money to. He didn't know. I knew about it. He comes over to me. He goes, I've been so blessed. This friend of mine came to me, and, and we were in dire straits. We needed a miracle. And he comes up to me and says, God told him to give me this money. It was exactly what we needed. That's a miracle. 
Are you in that place where God can use you in that way? It might be financially. That hurts, doesn't it? Our wallets. How can you be blessed by blessing others? Here's another point I'd like to point out. The servants under his direction were in a unique place of being blessed by this miracle. He could have done this miracle by himself, but he wanted the cooperation of men. He knew if the servants shared in the work, they would also share in the blessing. God desires for us to be used by him to bless others. And in so doing, we are blessed as well. We will be blessed when we are part of, the, of blessing others. The water pots were filled to the brim, making sure there wasn't any room for anybody to add or say that he added anything to the water to make the wine. Jesus wasn't going to add anything more. He was going to transform the water into wine. Now, we don't know if it became wine in the pots or as they scooped it out in the cup, it became wine. It doesn't say how or at what point. They just know that by the time they got to the man who was in charge, it was like a wedding, wedding that we would do, right? And the person who's running the, um, the whole catering thing, you would go to him. He'd taste the wine. He tasted it. It was transformed into wine at that point. Charles Spurgeon says this. I, I love this. This is a pattern for our faith and our obedience. When you are bidden, when you're called to believe in him, believe in him up to the brim, the most you can. When you're told to love him, love him up to the brim. And when you're commanded to serve him, serve him up to the brim. Do it to your fullest ability, right to the very top. Give it all you can. I love that scenario. And that thought process, as he said, fill them all the way to the top. There's nothing in there but water. Verse 9 says, When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. When we obey Jesus, we will always meet, he will always meet and exceed our expectations. As far as the servants knew, they were dipping a glass into water and were taking water to the master of the ceremony. But in faith, they obeyed Jesus. Luke 137 tells us, for nothing will be impossible with God. Do you believe that? Nothing is impossible for God. When we talk about miracles and things happening in your life and happening in people in your family and your friends, nothing's impossible for him. Nothing. Do you understand what the master of ceremonies is saying? It was the standard practice was to serve the best wine first. Once their palates got used to the wine and they couldn't taste a difference, then you give them the lesser wine because they won't taste it that it's not as good. But he said, you gave him the good wine, and then you gave him great wine. You're giving them great wine. He pointed it out. So instead of them being in disgrace, now they're being lifted up above. Because not only did they not run out of wine, but man, the last wine they gave was amazing. Jesus chose not only to create wine out of water with the supplies that he had on hand, He made the best wine possible. Henry Alford says this, in order for wine to be produced, we have the growth and the ripening of the grape, then the crushing of the grape in proper vessels, and then it has to ferment through fermentation. But here, all these these are in a moment brought about by their results. One minute he had water, and the next minute the whole process of the grapes growing, being mashed down into the liquid, fermenting, all happened in a moment. And it was done by the same power of the laws of nature, but he was created and unfolded like the capacities of man. 
like the capacities of God. We can have the same expectation when we obey and follow Jesus for him to answer beyond our imagination. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we ask or think. So is there a deeper meaning that, to this that we can glean from this miracle? Let's read the last two verses. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. And after this, he went to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples and they stayed there for a few days. The Gospel of John is also called the Gospel of Signs. There are going to be seven signs that Jesus does that John, there are more miracles than the seven, but John's purpose is to show Jesus is God. And so he points out seven miracles, and they're the seven we're going to look at. So Jesus was just beginning to show us his first sign by changing water into wine. And he's going to move up the scale every time he does a miracle till he gets to raising the dead. Each one's going to build on the last one. The wine symbolizes, point six, the wine symbolizes the covenant of love in his blood. The wine symbolizes the covenant of love in his blood. David Kuzik says this, Moses turned water into blood. That was when he was in Egypt, right? The river. Moses turned water into blood, showing that the law results in death. That's Exodus 7, 17 to 21. But Jesus' first miracle turned water into wine, showing the gladness and joy of his new work. This acts out of John, what John said in John 1.17, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We do it every time we have communion. We talk about that covenant. 1 Corinthians 11, 25. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We hear that over and over again, but do you recognize what that means? God had a covenant with Moses, and there was a sacrificial system. Jesus comes along and he said, now I have, I, I'm going to sacrifice myself and this is the new covenant. It's going to take, take the place of Moses' covenant with his people. His blood was the new covenant between us and God and it symbolized in wine of the Last Supper and its memory and when we do communion. But you know what else Jesus said? Remember, he used water. He used water that was for purification. And there's many levels to this. That's actually where they washed their hands and feet when they came in to the wedding. Now, it says they filled the pots up, so I'm hoping there wasn't dirty water in there, but God can make wine out of anything water, right? But it was for purification. And it says here, Jesus said that he was living water, did he not? He said, I'm living water. The stone jars were for purification rituals before eating. Jesus used them to make perfect wine. As we all know, everything is the sum of what you put into it. Ladies, you make a meal. Whatever you end up with is the sum of all the ingredients you put in to make it. Whatever the water was made out of, we know Jesus is the living water, and we know that his blood represented the covenant, our new covenant with him says in John 4:14, 4, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. So if Jesus is the source of living water, he is therefore sufficient for eternal life. He beckons us to take a drink. And if we do, we'll never thirst again. His blood illustrates the transformation from death to life found in the Lamb's sacrifice. John 7 says this, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from the heart of anyone who believes in me. Okay. Let me see everybody's eyes. Have you experienced the living water? 
a bubbling spring within your heart? Have you been immersed by his blood that covers you? It cleanses you? It confirms your eternity? At the end of John's gospel, in John 20, he writes why he wrote his gospel and what the miracles were meant. It says in verse 30, the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in, additions, in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. I don't know where you are in your belief. I have a, I'm not a judge. I'm not even a fruit inspector. I can see sometimes what's growing on your branch. Love, joy, peace, patience, and the rest. I don't know where you are in your relationship with God, and I know you may know him. I, I, I want to make sure you, he knows you. That's what's most important to me. That's what's in my heart. So what will it take for you to believe that Jesus is the Son of God if you doubt that? Will it take a miracle for you to finally believe, to step out in faith and say, I've heard about this God guy for a long time, but I can live my life down here fine and I don't ever see him and he never meets me in the middle of doing something wrong, so I don't even know that I believe there is a God. Lots of people don't. Lots of people don't. Lots of churchgoers don't live like they know him, but they fill a seat every Sunday. Not talking about present company unless it applies to you. It says, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. So if you're waiting for a miracle, faith means believing without seeing a miracle. I, my favorite person in this miracle story are those servants. They got to step back and witness it. And then they got to take it out to the knowing, it says there, and they knew where it came from. They never told the man. They were blessed by being able to be used by Jesus. What must that be like? I know. Do you? Do you know what it feels like to be blessed in serving someone else? Allowing God to serve someone through you. The blessing, you get the blessing as well as they do. What can God use you for? Who can you bless? Start with those you know. Start with your family and your friends, but God may take you to a total stranger. This gentleman I spoke about who was told by God to go take this money, he knew the other man. It wasn't a stranger. It wasn't a family member. It was a man he knew, to, knew in an organization. And when they, he went to him and he said this, and that man needed that. He'd been praying to God. God answered that prayer. And to that man that he gave the money to, that was a miracle. But how it blessed the other man who gave him the money. Desire that. But it, it, it's all between you and your relationship. Do you have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ? When you meet him, will he say he knows you? If he does, and you know him, because for him to know you, you would have to know him. He wants to use you while you're here. Frankly, when we're saved, the reason he's not taking us up is because he has more work down here for us to do. Are you ready to be used? Closing for today to take home and think about Jesus is the source of living water for purification. Will you allow him to perfect and transform you today? If you're a follower of hers, you, his, you can still be transformed. 
from where you are right now to be able to be used. To him. Just don't walk out of here and say, I already know him. I don't need to be transformed. I don't need to be changed. Yes, renew your mind. Constantly be in his word. Constantly, the more you're in his word and you're in communication with him and you're with fellowship with other believers, you're going to grow in your relationship and be more ready for what he has planned for you to do. I'm going to end, we're going to end with a song that's called The Same God. We've sung it through different series. He's the same God as this story. Same one who does miracles, who wants to do a miracle in your life and also wants to be able to do a miracle through you for someone else's life. Submit yourself to him. So when we sing this song and you hear all the different people in the Bible that were there, it was the same God who was with each one of them. It's the same God who desires and loves you. Loves you like his child. Parents, he loves you like you love your kids. But more. Because we can only live to a human level. He's my God level. Allow him to use you today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you about the miraculous things that you do. The fact that we're sitting in this room and that we are followers of yours are miracles in themselves. There's nothing special about any of us, yet you've allowed us to fall under the cloak of Jesus' blood and be saved. So that when you look down and you see us, you don't see our sin anymore, you see Jesus. What an amazing blessing that is, Lord. So now, what do we do with that? We need to live our lives for Jesus, and we need to go out and be Jesus to people. Let them see in us and in our lives you, who you are, to see your heart, to see how you love, and to see how you want to love each of us and those that we come in contact with. Who is our sphere of influence? They're the ones that you want us to make an effect on, to shine a light in the darkness, to have them find you through. So, Lord, thank you for what we're going to learn through each one of these miracles because they truly are miraculous. And, Lord, I know there are lots of times you've done miracles in our lives that we weren't even aware of. When you kept us at home because we couldn't find the keys and we finally get five minutes later, we're, on, we're late for work and we get in our car and we come up, Across an accident that just happened and could have been us. We don't know, but maybe that was you keeping us, and that's a miracle. There are miracles that happen in our lives and those around us every day. Help us to see them, Lord, and help us to see them as miracles and help it build our faith and our connection to you. Lord, we love you and praise you and thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.